So you're ready to create your first adventure. You've been watching the videos on this uh, channel and you're like, yeah, 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 I like this idea of OGAS and NPC AI and, and the world running itself and all that kind of stuff. But how do we actually then create an adventure if we're not supposed to plan anything? I I'm confused. Help me. Okay, this is how you do it. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of How to Be a Great GM. You've been following this series now for a couple of weeks, exploring this notion of really, really looking at GMing from a totally different perspective. And I think it's been an absolute awesome journey for yourselves and I know certainly for myself. As I become more aware of the things that I'm doing, I now start to put those into action and it really has been helping my game. So I hope it's been helping your game. Now, this video is in three parts, all in one video. Yes, we're not breaking it up, don't panic. It's going to be a slightly longer video, so settle yourselves down. But I wanted it to be something that you could use. You watch it once or twice, then you kind of go to the chapter you need to go to, and then you are done. So it's in three phases, so bear that in mind. You kind of need to watch each phase to understand how to create an adventure in totality. Now, we're going to be using Dungeons & Dragons as our basic operating system in terms of rules, because it's important for us to have a con... con, 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 con because it's important for us to have a common frame of reference. And so we'll be using Dungeons and Dragons. Before we go any further, however, if you are a fan of this channel, I have to talk to you about my Kickstarter, the practical guide to becoming a great GM. Now, folks, because of the insane response to this book and to the Kickstarter, we've actually now got to the point where we will be adding a second book to the Kickstarter, which is a complete reworking of my first book, which was called A Complete Guide to Creating Epic Campaigns. That book, it's got new, it's new artwork, new layout, and most important of all is the content has been updated to now include all of the thoughts that are in this book, plus all of these thoughts that are on this YouTube channel now about OGAS and so on and so on, making it basically a brand new book. So that Kickstarter, two books effectively in one Kickstarter. So if you haven't backed it yet, link down below, show some love. And even if you don't have the financial resources, because finance security before gaming is always important, even if you don't, just share the Kickstarter and everyone can know about it and hopefully get it to its last and final uh, point where uh, everyone is then benefiting from that. Now, into designing an adventure in Dungeons & Dragons using the methods that I have been speaking about in terms of all these videos, all right? Part one. There is no plot, there is only a plan. I, myself, have to get away from using the word plot. It is a bad, naughty, naughty word. Ie, no, nay, nyet. This is not in our vocabulary anymore. Plot is now gone. It is dead. Say it with me. Plot is dead. Because plot gives us the implication that someone has planned out all of this already and that we will be following along those steps. So we are now going to be planners only. We plan things. We don't plot things. So plan, plan, plan. What is your plan for your campaign is a lot more useful just from a psychological perspective than what is your plot. Again, because it implies that you are actually controlling something. Now, I've got a lot of notes on my screens here, so you're going to have to just forgive me because I want to make sure that you get exactly what is in my head. Okay, I needed an lithid to just kind of suck this out and just spread it to everybody. Okay, all right, 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 right. So, plan, plan, plan. Whose plan is it? There are three things that can have a plan within your world space. One is the villain, the nemesis, the henchman, whatever you want to call them. They will have a plan. Two, the players. The players will have a plan. And three, the universe. It doesn't have a plan, but it has certain things that it does that kind of follow along the same path every single time. And so you could argue are effectively plans. Even though there is no sentience behind it, we still have to treat it like a plan. Just Accept it, okay? <laughs> Accept it. Those are the three things that can have plans. We're going to look at the moment in this video just on the villain plans. It's important that our villains have a plan. They will always have a plan. So how do you come up with that plan? Well, 
The first thing that you need to identify is what is their ultimate goal? Remember that great big thing called the sentence? Well, we still have that. That is still fundamental to how we design our adventures. Someone wants something badly by a specific time and is having difficulty getting it using certain components because something is resisting or preventing them from achieving their goal. <gasps> it's a long sentence, but you need to have that sentence. And I have done videos on how to create that sentence 10,000 times, but it doesn't, it, it, that's not what we're going to be talking about in today's video. What we are talking about is once you have that sentence, you figure out that sentence, conjure up a villain, any villain that you like. So let's say an orc. An orc wants to invade a village and plunder and pillage it for the glory of his tribe, but he's having difficulty doing so because the village is surrounded by a strong defense of palisade walls and ditches, and he has no idea how to get over those. The problem is, is that the big orc moot where they all gather is going to be happening in the next, uh, let's say, three weeks weeks and if he doesn't have some kind of loot or plunder from this little village he is going to be seen as being an outcast and will be thrown out of the village. That's the example I have just come up with and I was making it up as I was talking to you working out the sentence as I was going along. I hope that made sense to you and I hope it was a good example for you to be able to follow along with. Okay so now we then have to say we have to break it down. What are the things that this orc is going to need in order to enact his plan? So we say, okay, well, we need to get stuff. Now, this is also old, old ideology from the early days of this channel, but it's relevant today and much more so than it ever was before. So the orc needs to get some stuff. So the orc needs to get a warband. The orc needs to get war dogs. The orc needs to get something to get into that village. Now, this is where you can be entirely creative and say, okay, well, the orc, the orc, um, well, the orc needs to get something to get into the village. Once the orc is in the village, the orc then needs to find stuff of value. They need to find the golden talk that they can hang around their neck or the chieftain's crown or the statue in the middle of the field of in the middle of the village. You have to figure out what that could be based on what is the most interesting, what is the most exciting, what is the most devious, what is the, the most random. It's entirely up to you. And remember, Remember, your orc has a goal to get something that will prove that they are of value. Okay. Once they've got, the, once they've figured out what they need to get or where they need to get it from, they then need to actually escape and get away from that village, and then they need to present it at the at the moot. Right. So those are the four things that needs to happen. And where did those four things come from? That was just me thinking through the plan. We've got to get in there. We've got to get the thing. Then we've got to get out of there, and then we have to actually present it to gain our honor. All from that sentence. So you need to break it down. I like to go for four steps, four or five steps. You know me. I like to go for four or five steps, but generally speaking, it's just logically thinking through the plan. What do you need to do in order to get from point A to point E or D, depending? You then take that and then you work out what resources does this villain or henchman or whatever have at their disposal? Are they limited or are they unlimited? If they are limited resources, this is a single solitary young orc who wants to break into this village. They're not going to be able to hire an entire army of kobolds who can dig a tunnel underneath the palisade, come up in the village and claim that object. They can't do that. They don't have the resources for that. But they might be able to sh gather together a small amount of coin to hire an airship that's controlled by gnomes to fly over the village so that he can climb down a rope and get into the middle of the village. Maybe he could do that. Or if his resources are completely unlimited, then he can do all of those things at the same time. He can have a diversion which gets the villagers to leave the village and then he can get in there. Maybe that's actually his route, is that he doesn't have unlimited resources. He sets the wooden palisade on fire on one side of the camp because that's fairly cheap and easy to do. And then he tries to break in from the other side. So we could do that. We then go a next step and say, okay, well, he now needs to find this thing that he's after. So he's going to need information on where that comes from. That means that perhaps he could abduct a villager who's out in the forest to then ask them questions. Where is the statue in the middle of the village? Hang on. It could be something along those lines. Figure it out. This is where you are coming in in terms of creating your plan. But how do we know how the particular individual is going to come up with their plan? We ogas them. 
we owe gas them and we, we need to do that because that allows us to understand exactly what's going to happen. So when we look at our orc, we say, well, we've got all of these different options floating around in our heads. We haven't decided on any of them yet, by the way, but we have all of these options floating around in our heads. Time to now Ogas. So this Ogre, his occupation perhaps is Scout, because that's more interesting than if it was something else. Now we know he's trying to get his coming of age um, object, item, whatever it is. So perhaps he's a junior scout who uh, forages around, maybe he's a bit of a hunter, something along those lines, or he could be a young warrior. It's entirely up to us to choose which of those gives us the most interesting combination. So once we've chosen his occupation, we know what his goal is, that is his sentence. We know what his attitude is. Could he be angry? Could he be frustrated? Could he be rushing? He might be rushing. He's trying to definitely get it over and done with as fast as he can before the moot happens. So perhaps he's a little bit uh, hasty. Perhaps he's careless. Something along those lines. We then need to say, okay, cool. What are at, What is at stake? Well, at stake is his entire reputation within the clan. If he fails, that's it. Tickets for him. Thank you very much for playing. He now lives on his own, is an outcast, and will probably die. That's a pretty high stake, which means he's willing to do almost anything. So now we take that and we go, ha ha, excellent. We now have an orc who is going to try and break into this village. He's going to try and break into the village by setting a giant fire on one side of the village, distracting everybody to then get them to that side of the village so he can then sneak in through the main gates and then get to the object. But in order to get to the object, he has to take one of the villagers hostage first and interrogate them as to where is this sacred idol being kept in which hut so he can go straight to that hut. Once he is inside the village and he has this object, he then needs to escape. His plan to escape is that he has some rope with him and he is going to go to the far wall on the far side of the um, ring fence, uh, palisade, words fail me, of the palisade. He's going to throw the rope over. He's going to climb over that rope. And on the other side, he has got some camouflage gear, which he has now put in place beforehand. So he will then dress into that and then he can disappear into the forest and no one will know that he's there. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm breaking down each of his steps into something that makes logical sense for this particular individual. He is going to A, have some rope. He's going to take a villager hostage. He's going to leave some camouflage gear on the other side of the wall. Is this too much thinking for an orc? I don't think so, because he's a scout. Scouts know all about hunting animals, leaving little bits of bait here and there, ploy, pulling uh, animals to a specific spot, having things loaded up in certain places, building traps, all that kind of stuff. I think that is absolutely fine for anything with an average intelligence or even a lower intelligence, but something that has as their occupation a standard thing that they would be doing on a regular basis. I have never met a hunter who is not in tune with the way of hunting animals. So that is his plan. We now get to step number two. Unlink your plot points now. So now we're going, okay, well, we 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 have this, this orc and we've got this kind of stuff going on. Um, and we've said that we are planning on putting the, the camouflage clothing on the west side of the um, fortress or the palisade wall. I can't remember that word. On the west side of the palisade wall. And we're going to have the fire on the east side of the palisade wall. And we're going to have this hunter, uh, this... this um, individual is going to be abducted by the orc um, on a Tuesday and so we've got all of our plans together. Your players then wander into the village and they go, ha, huh, nice statue in the middle of the village. Um, maybe that's a risky leaving it out there for everybody to see. Don't you think maybe kind of, well, maybe we should just liberate that. The players are going to be having their own plans. They're going to be running their own things. So what that means is by unhinging or removing your plot points from the locations you plan them to be in, the murder weapon, the crime, the thing that's going to be taking place, you can then drop them wherever you like and you can present them to your players in any way you like because none of your plan, your plan as the GM, by the way, is zero. You have no plan. None of your orcs plan is yet in motion. 
So the orc can change his mind in a split second and move stuff to different locations dip and, and, and just have different... It might not even be an orc now. Suddenly you change it to someone who's within the village who's trying to steal the statue. And they realize, hang on a moment, I don't have to set fire to this thing. I just need to encourage the PCs to steal the statue. And then I'll steal it from them. Do you see how suddenly you still have an NPC who is trying to steal that statue, but now they're just going to let the PCs do it first because they've started to hear rumors that the PCs are interested in it. Or they go and try and hire the PCs to steal it for them. The fundamental thing hasn't changed. Someone wants that statue badly, and by a specific time, which is sooner rather than later, and is going to be using the PCs to get it for them now. So you are very dynamic in terms of how this adventure is now going to play out. The orc, though, let's say, for example, he abducts the villager. This could be a plot hook that you give to your players. Well, guess what? My uh, Oh, welcome, great player uh, uh, heroes. Uh, our huntsman hasn't come back for the last three days. We're worried. Wouldn't you go into that forest and have a look for him? We'd be we'd be doing it ourselves, but um, there's been some orcs gathering in the valley uh, three miles distant, and we're a bit nervous. The PCs go out into the forest, and of course they will find the hunter. The hunter's been bound, gagged, beaten, and abused, and that sort of thing. And the hunter might say, oh, um, I have um, been abducted by an orc who wanted to know where something was. He left about half an hour ago. Except, because you are a dynamic GM, you are going, hang on a moment. My orc might have actually thought that someone will come looking for this hunter. So maybe the hunter is a trap. And so if the PCs just walk up to the hunter, suddenly a net grabs the PCs, pulls them up into the air, and now they're stuck in this net. And they've got to go through a skill challenge uh, or use acrobatics or uh, whatever um, skill you, you want them to use to try and get out of this net, which delays them. So then they have to rush to get back to the orc camp. Again, look at what your NPC who has the plan, look at what they're going to be doing. They're going to be trying to slow people down if they get to the hunter. Would he kill the hunter? Nothing in his his Ogas says that he will kill people necessarily. He is very desperate, so he might kill people, but maybe not necessarily. Do you see now how this adventure, which we didn't really have any, as GM, any control over, just by keeping those questions rolling in our head, what would I do if I was the hunter? I've got these skills, I've got those skills. Suddenly the adventure starts to change and take take effect and to take place. So generally speaking, what I will do is when I have this plan, obviously, and I, I don't feel like I need to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Obviously, if you have NPCs that have plans and the PCs do not come across any evidence of that plan, if they have no way of influencing that plan, if they have nothing, gee giddy up, horsey, I'm on a roll. If they have no way of interacting with that plan, the plan is completely meaningless and you have wasted your life and your time. Go away. You've missed the point. The PCs must interact with the plan if you are going to follow that plan through. Otherwise, leave the plan, abandon the plan and run with another plan. Because if they can't interfere with the plan, then the plan will go ahead because otherwise it's your NPCs stopping other NPCs, which means you're playing with yourself. And we know that that is not part of a role playing game unless you're playing a solo game, in which case then slightly except uh, you get the point. So the players have to be able to get involved in that quest somehow. The way that you give your plot hooks, your hooks, again, look at that plot hook. That word has come back. Twee plan your plan the way you give out your plan is come up with random things around the village and see how they could link to the main plot the pcs oh we've got a hunter who got lost in the forest we're very worried about him would you go and look no we don't want to go and look at that we're going to go and investigate something else over there I like to, to, to just see where the PCs are interested in going. What are they interacting with? What are they looking like? They go to the tavern. The tavern keeper's there. The tavern keeper says, Oh, uh, yeah, well, um, the uh, business has been slow, you know, with the orcs moving through. It's pretty tough. Um, but they'll be gone in a couple of weeks' time once their moot happens. And it happens every year. It's usually They don't usually give us any trouble. 
you start to feed into the bigger picture that you have created around this NPC, you're just dropping it in. Now, isn't that violating the NPC's AI? It isn't because, remember, you are using that NPC to deliver information that belongs to the GM and to the bigger um, role-playing game, but they are still delivering it in a way that makes sense to them. So that's why the barkeeper was upset that there was not a lot of business because everyone was keeping away. Why were they keeping away? Because of the orc moot. So it kind of makes sense that he would be talking about it. Nonetheless, so you plant as many NPCs as you like, and every time a PC interacts with an NPC, just give them a little taste of something that might lead them there. Now, it could also be that they get to the trapper, and the trapper goes, well, the huntsman hasn't come back yet, but if you want to go and get me 12 beaver skins, I'll give you a gold per beaver skin. That might get the players more interested, because now they can go hunting and they can get easy money, as opposed to going on the plot. Meanwhile, of course, they are going to go out into that forest, and they're going to go and find the hunter and the trap that the orc is in, and bingo you have now launched the game and now again if the pcs go oh there's an orc going to go and rob something from the village oh well we're going to go and hunt those beavers when they come back the entire village has burnt to the ground right because the pcs have now had opportunities to interact with those plot lines they haven't necessarily followed them not that you are saying that they must follow them by the way this is not the point they have chosen not to follow them because they're going on another plot, which they feel is more interesting, which is their prerogative, and which means we now go on that journey with them, and we look at the difficulties that they're going to have in terms of hunting beavers, because it's no longer an NPC plot now. A plan! 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 It's no longer an NPC plan. Now it is a nature plan. The beavers will have done stuff, especially if one of them is a giant mutant beaver and has built a dam trap, which is now going to entrap our PCs as they try to hunt beaver pelt, which is why it's worth a gold piece in the first place. That's now an adventure on its own. When the PCs get back, the village burnt down because they interacted with the NPC plot. Plan! <sighs> They interacted with the NPC plan. The NPC plan then continued to go, even though they weren't interfering with it. Which now, now it brings me to part three, is where we now say, okay, cool. We have now got, a, we've got a lot of stuff going on here. None of it we know is going to happen for certain. We don't know about the beavers because that was made up on the fly. We don't know about any of the other stuff, but we do have our central orcish story. Do you see what battle maps we now have to create? The battle maps we have to create are the village, most likely, a forest area, most likely, and perhaps a river, stretch of river. That's it. So in planning for our first adventure, we know we have a village, we know we have a forest, we know we have a river. Now, if we design those maps to be dual purpose so that each map has got two areas on it that could be used for any kind of contingency we so like, well, then that's absolutely fine. Do we spend hours meticulously working out the trap of the, uh, the orc around the hunter person? Because I kind of like that. So I think that's part of his plan. We don't. We don't. We don't at all. We can just say, well, that's probably where it will be. Because remember, we've unhinged all those points. So even if the PCs decide they're not going to go into the forest, they're going to go out into the plains. They will find the hunter in the plains because who says the orc didn't take him there? Maybe the orc didn't want to go anywhere near the other orcs in case they saw what he was doing and tried to steal his thunder. So he's taken this guy out onto the plains. That's entirely, entirely feasible, and no player will ever know that that isn't true. So, in a sense, what you are doing is you have got these plans for your NPCs. And for your first adventure, you don't need to have anything other than a first starting plan. But what you do need to realize is that everything else in that village, everybody else in that village, should have goals because it's Ogas. And so anybody that the PCs talk to will be able to give them adventures, will be able to give them options. Well, go hunt the beavers. Okay, great. But how do we then create all of those maps and things? How do we plan the stats? How do we come up with all of those encounters? Well, that is where we then step back and we say, okay, well, we know our three maps. We need the village because a lot of stuff might be happening in the village. We need a forest section because we know whatever happens within the village will be linked to that forest. And then maybe let's have a river section or let's have a plain section. Create a generic kind of space. 
Like I said, dual purpose maps will help you. And I'm going to be doing a video on dual purpose maps next week. So come back for that one. If you're not sure on what I mean by that, we have that. We then say, OK, let's look at the monsters that the PCs might encounter. Well, we know we're going to have to have statistics potentially for our orc scout, our, our hero NPC, if you like. We're going to have some statistics for woodland creatures, things that they might encounter in the forest. We're not going to have a thousand stats. What we might do, and this is what I do as I go, well, there might be some bears in the forest. I might use some spiders. I might use some pixies. Um, I look at the level of the characters. I also look at what my players are like. What is their game preference? Do they like mystery? Do they like combat? Do they like this? Do they like that? If they like combat, then I might have some wolves that are hunting or that have been deranged and gone mad by a weird druid. Where the hell did that come from? Well, no, I just have a druid out in the forest whose ogas is to protect nature and believes that all of civilization should be wiped out. So they're breeding a whole bunch of wolves that are going to go and start hunting down all of the outlying villages until eventually they can build up bigger forces and then take on the cities. Don't you have druids in your forest who've got goals? You should have because you're playing in Dungeons and Dragons, so we know druids are everywhere. So anything that happens suddenly spawns a whole bunch of new adventures which come out of nowhere. That is, in a long shell, not in a nutshell, um, how I then start going about my adventures. I will design those maps, I will have those stats for the NPCs available, and then I will have that singular plan in action. And then I sit back and I say, right, players, engage. They will start, they'll burn that village down, they will cut down the forest, they'll dam that river, they'll skin the beavers, they'll slay the orc, and it doesn't matter because all of that is just taking place within that space and I'm just reacting to it. And as we go on, now suddenly the players start to discover other things, etc., etc. For a campaign, you are doing this on a gigantic scale, not on a macro scale. So for a campaign, your villain will have an even bigger plan not a simple little plan, and they will have broken it down into a series of little steps that they need to take and get to, and we'll talk about that in another video if you really want me to, um, but basically doing an adventure or doing a campaign, it's just a matter of scale and, and, and delivering it and keeping it going in, in that way. That's it from me. Um, I can't say anything more because this video has really gone back to the old length of the old videos. I suggest watching at 1.5 times speed. It might make it go a little bit faster. Anyway, a, a reminder of Practical Guide to Becoming a Great GM has all of this information in it with exercises, with examples. Um, there are tasks for you to do. The Kickstarter has unlocked an entire workbook, which will now go with this, a print-on-demand workbook that you can print and, and fill in as you're going. It will help you create your campaigns. Whether you use pre-made uh, systems or whether you make your own homebrew world systems, this book will help you, as well as the complete guide to epic campaigns, which uh, has now been added to this amazing, amazing book making a bundle. So there we go. And of course, a massive thank you to all of you for watching all the way through to the end and for putting up with my shenanigans in today's video and to all of these wonderful people who support the channel on a monthly basis. Those Patreons, I absolutely adore you. And uh, until we meet again next week, I wish you the very happiest of gaming.